Greetings. Thank you for joining us today. It's so good to be with you. We are City Bible Church at Home, and we are coming to you today from the study at the church into your home. And we pray God's peace and his presence in your home. As we begin this morning, let me just start with prayer. And Father, as we approach your throne of grace, Lord, we do so in fear and trepidation because we understand we are coming before a holy, holy God. But we also recognize, Lord, you invite us to come. You bid us come. And we know you wouldn't invite us to come and not desire to give us wings. And so I pray that you would take those wings and, and, and bring your words to our hearts today as we open your word. Lord, teach us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, we've been looking at the relationship that Saul had with David. I've, I've titled this mini-series, Wounded. Last time we looked at spear throwers. Today I want to look at what to do when you are the target. What to do when you are the target. I saw a comic strip recently that, that really tickled me and I thought I'd share it with you. It was in a hunting magazine and it was two deer that were walking through the bush. One of the deer had a target on his back and the other deer looked at him and he said, bummer of a birthmark, Harold. <laughs> hunting season, target. You know, I, I couldn't help but think that David must have felt like that. He must have felt like he had a target on his back because every time he turned around, Saul was trying to pin him to the wall with his spear. You know, we're, we're told about it at least three times. It happened over and over again. Saul had an issue with David and it really stems from something that happened back in chapter 8 of First Samuel when they come back from defeating the giant and the Philistines, they march back into the city and the women come out singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And at that moment, it caused that green-eyed monster of jealousy to rise up within Saul. When it did, it began this seething anger within him. And then it turned to a paranoia. He was constantly watching David, but then it moves to fear. And we see when we get to chapter 18 that, that he becomes fearful of David. But that fear then goes to an obsession. And, and you got to wonder at this point, God, where are you in this? Why are you allowing all of this to happen to David? But folks, we need to understand that God is doing something in David's life on a multiple of levels. We seem to think that God works in one dimension, that he, that he just is a one-dimensional God. But folks, he's always at work at multiple levels, multiple levels. And what we see here is that he is strengthening David. We see that he's stretching David, and we also see that he is sanctifying David. But why does God allow all of this to happen in David's life? I mean, folks, this goes on for about 10 years. 10 years. Well, I believe the reason was that God was trying to get the Saul out of David. He's trying to get the Saul out of David. And he, I, at least I think anyway, I think he allows you and I to go through the same kinds of things because he wants to get that spear-throwing tendency in us out. He wants to get the Saul out of us. Saul was a man who had a great amount of potential. He had great possibility, but he becomes problematic. He becomes almost like a pestilence to the people of God. He goes from being a king with so much possibility to literally being a plague on the people of God. And so here's David, 
and David is on the run from Saul. Well, David marries Saul's daughter. Remember, that was part of the prize that he, that he won by defeating the giant. And David marries Saul's daughter, but Saul comes and he manipulates her. He, he, he's trying, at least he's making an, a, an attempt to get at David. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 28, we read this. Thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was still more afraid of David. So Saul became David's enemy continually, continually. You know, I looked up that word to see what it meant. And you know what it means? Continually, every day, 24 seven, it never stopped. Now, how David handles this is really remarkable. It really is. In verse 30, um, we're going to look at verse 30 and then we'll look over at chapter 19 and verse 8 because they, they really speak to how he handled it. You know, in, in the midst of the way he was being treated, verse 30 says, Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war, and so it was whenever they went out, that David behaved more wisely than all of the servants of Saul so that his name became uh, highly esteemed. I mean, David kept his head and he did what was right, did what was right in the sight of the Lord and before man as well. And then over in, in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 8, listen to what it says. And there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow and they fled from him. Understand, this is in the midst of be him being uh, chased by Saul, Saul trying to kill him. He does what he's supposed to do. He carries out his position. He defeats the Philistines. All the while, Saul is trying to, 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 to kill him. He's treating him so unjustly. Now, let me just point out that, that God doesn't come down and pat him on the back because he's done what's right. Remember, this goes on for 10 years and God doesn't come down and, 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 and pat him on the back every time he does something right or, or says something right. <clears throat> Pardon me. God doesn't show up to pat you or I in the back every time we do the right thing either. Every time we say the right thing. In fact, the point is, we don't do the right thing for God to come down and pat us on the back. We do it because it's the right thing to do. That's why we do it. And that is David. That's David. That's why he does what he does in the midst of all that he's dealing with. He handles himself in such a way that the Bible says he acted wisely. Here's Saul. And Saul is still trying to pin David to the wall with a spear. But I want you to watch what David does. I want to ask you, what do you do when you become the target of someone's anger? What do you do when you're the target of someone's hatred? I want to give you four things that you should do. And I hope you have a pen and a paper. I want you to write this down because this is something that you can take and apply it to your life. This is right out of God's word. What do you do when you are the target? The fact is every one of us have experienced it. Every one of us, you know, I've been on the receiving end of someone that is, 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 is bound and determined to make us a target. But, but how is it we are supposed to react and respond to that? Well, the first thing, and, and by the way, all of these four things begin with the letter D. I've done that to make it easy to remember. So the first thing is distance. I think that we should put distance between us and them. And we're going to pick it up in verse 9 of chapter 19. It says, Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing music with his hand. 
Isn't that something? You know, David, you know, is, is there with a harp. He's playing. Don't let this get by you because this is good stuff. Saul is holding that spear. He, he's angry, bitter, and that's what he's hanging on to. Well, David is praising the Lord with, with the harp. Man, I mean, that could be a whole sermon right there, but let me press on. Saul tries to pin David to the wall with the spear, but David slips away. He he gets away, uh, away from Saul's presence, and that spear sticks to the wall, and David escapes. David is ministering to Saul with music, and Saul is trying to kill him. Look at verse 10. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped by night. Man alive, David must have been one fast dude. He must have been fast. But understand, this is not David. This is not who David is. This is so uncharacteristic of who David is. He's a warrior. He doesn't back down from the Philistines. He doesn't back down from the giants. He doesn't back down from anyone. But the best thing you can do, folks, when somebody is throwing a spear at you is to put some distance between you and them. Verse 11, 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 11 so Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So in order to put him to death, Saul sends the CIA, the Secret Service, to watch his house. He probably had drones flying overhead as well. He's monitoring the activity but his wife, Saul's daughter, says, listen, I know my dad. I know what he's like. He, 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 he's trying to kill you. And if you're here, he's going to kill you. And then verse 12 says that, so Michael let David down through the window and he went and fled and escaped. And again, folks, this is not what David does. He isn't somebody that flees. He's a warrior. But this time he flees because sometimes the best thing we can do is is when someone throws a spear at us is to put distance between you, them and us. And so for 10 years, for the next 10 years, David puts distance between himself and Saul. Let me give you the second thing I see here. I see discernment, discernment. We need to have some discernment in order to understand what, what's being said sometimes. Saul apologizes to David, but he does it five different times. I find that amazing. Five different times. And David had to have enough discernment to be able to understand what this guy is really saying. When people are throwing spears at you, when, 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 when people are trying to attack you, you need to have some godly discernment to be able to understand what they're saying, what's behind what they're saying. What do they really mean? Let me give you an illustration of this because over in, in chapter 26, David slips into Saul's camp. He's in stealth mode. He's like a Navy SEAL, and, and he slips into the camp and, and he takes Saul's spear in his canteen, his water jug. Then he goes over to the opposite hill and he, he yells and he, he yells at Abner. And in verse 20, uh, uh, 15 of, of chapter 26, so David said to Abner, are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your Lord the king? For one of the people came to camp to destroy the Lord the king. He's saying, Abner, are you a man or a mouse? Verse 16, the thing that you have done is not good. The Lord lives. You do, As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear and is and the jug of water that was by his head. 
Then Saul knew David's voice and he said, Is that your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, O Lord the King. And he said, Why does the Lord... Um, why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore, please, my Lord the King, hear the words of, of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. He's saying, I'm going to repent and the Lord will 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 forgive me. But if it's the children of men, may they be a curse before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. So now, do not let the, my blood fail, or I'm sorry, do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Verse 21, then Saul said, I have sinned, return my son David, for I will harm you no more because my life was precious in your sight this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. Verse 22, and David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. David says, there's no way. No way, I don't trust you. I don't care what you say. You've said it five times. I'm not coming. How many know that when someone is throwing a spear at you, they aren't exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit? You're not getting from them love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness when they're attacking you. We need to have discernment. We need to have discernment to understand what's being said and why they're saying it. And then we need to get before God and we need to ask him for his discernment in these things to be able to understand what's really happening, what's really going on. What should I be doing? What is my response in this? Discernment, discernment. And that comes from God's word and being before God in his word. But now let me give you the third thing. And it's the word defensive, defensive. But Understand, I am not telling you to become defensive. I am saying that what we need to do is defend ourselves against becoming like they are. We need to be careful that we guard ourselves into not throwing spears back at them. Can I show you something very quickly? Psalm 37. Psalm 37. It was probably written in all probability when David was fleeing from Saul. Psalm 37 verse 27 says this, Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. Um, they are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Listen, for us to retaliate is neither healthy or or spiritual. It's neither. Lord, fill my mind, fill my heart with something other than a way I can retaliate. You know, there was more than one occasion when David could have taken Saul's life. In fact, there were a whole group of people who were urging him to do it, but he wouldn't do it. He guarded against it. Now, let me give, the, give you the last thing, and it's dependency. Dependency. The fourth thing is dependency. Still in, in Psalms, look at Psalm 54 because there was a real dependency in David's life. The Ziphites hide him. But then they sell him out to Saul and David escapes yet again. And listen to what he writes in Psalm 54, beginning in verse one. He says, Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers, that's the Ziphites, strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them, Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. 
He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of this trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. You know, he could look at Saul with not one ounce of hatred in his heart, not one bit of vengeance. He just turned him over to God. He gave him up to God so that God would look after him. The Bible says, um, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And in the midst of being this target of Saul, David said, I will depend on my God. He understood that God was in control. He understood that. He was just going to trust him. And that's what he's saying in that psalm. Have you ever gone to a, a, a grocery store with, with children and the grocery store have, have those carts, you know, with cars? And, and what's, what's the cart the child wants in? They want in that car. Chris and I uh, take, take our little grandbabies into the grocery store and that's the car they want. And they get in that car and they start wheeling that thing for all they're worth and they're headed for one place the cereal aisle. And what is it they want? They want cocoa puffs. They want sugared cereal. Our kids call us Papa and Gia. And if Gia is with us, they're going to get Weetabix and granola and, and uh, Muselix or something healthy. But if Papa's with them and Gia's not watching too close anyway, into the cart will go Cocoa Puffs or whatever, Fruit Loops, and and, uh, and that's just the way it is. I'm, I confess, I confess, but think about it. That's the world. That's the world. They think they're in control, just like my little grand gal, thinking she's steering that cart. The world thinks they're in control, but ultimately our God is in control. And that's why when you turn on the news, Later on, and the news tells you just what terrible situations are around the world right now. Understand, they just think they're in control. But the God of heaven, the God of earth, is the one that's in control. Is that true? Is that true when somebody's throwing a spear at you as God in control? If it's true, two things two things I want to show you. First of all, there's a purpose. And secondly, there's a process. A purpose. God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Why are you allowing this, this situation where I have a target on my back? God, I'm wounded. I'm hurting. I don't understand. God, where are you in all of this? Why are you allowing all of this to happen in my life? Let me show you something from the Apostle Paul's life? Do you think that Paul was ever wounded? Do you think that he was ever the target of someone? Second Corinthians is probably the most personal letter that Paul ever writes. Second Corinthians. And, and that church at Corinth had turned on him. They had they, they were just being nasty to him. They were making fun of him. They were mocking him. They were griping, they were complaining. They said his preaching was weak. They said that he looked funny, but I want you to listen to what Paul says to them in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. <coughs> he says this, but we have this treasure. What's that treasure? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. There's a, a depiction of Paul that has him as this short, bald, big-nosed, bull-legged, you know, unibrowed character. That's a literal depiction that came from Iconium, which is one of the places that Paul preached. And he says, Paul says, I'm as ugly as a clay pot, but I have this treasure in me. I have this treasure. And, and when I'm wounded, 
Paul doesn't come out. When I'm wounded, what comes out is the Lord Jesus Christ. He shines through those wounds. Is there a, a purpose in God allowing us to go through someone throwing spears at us? I believe there is. I believe it's so that when we are wounded, when we're hurt, out of you shines the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what comes through. Paul says in verse 8, "We are, listen to this, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Oh man, that's good stuff. There is a purpose in, in that the light of his presence would shine through in the midst of that woundedness. Not bitterness, but his glory, for, for his glory. But what's the process? That's the purpose. What's the process? We believe that God is in control, don't we? We do. And if he's in control, then God has obviously allowed this to happen and the purpose is that it would produce fruit. And even though David was never hit by Saul's spear, it wounded him. It fractured their relationship. But did it produce any fruit in his life? Oh, you bet it did. Let me show you something. Again, Psalms. Psalm 34, verse 1. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Verse 3, O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Do you know when he wrote this? He wrote this when he's running from Saul and he, he ran to the Philistines and he gets in front of Abimelech and he's he's thinking, you know, I, I, I got to be able to convince Abimelech that there's something off here and so he, he, he needs to act like he's lost his mind and and when he does Abimelech says listen I got enough crazy in my life I don't, don't need any more and so he, he says get this guy away from me. David just wanted to praise the Lord. He knew that he just wanted to praise the Lord. And out of all of that pain, out of all of that woundedness, came so much of what we read in the Psalms. Out of all that hurt came the Psalms. Look at Psalm 18, which is probably one of the greatest Psalms ever written. On one of those occasions when he was delivered from Saul, he writes this, Psalm 18, verse 1, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He's the target of Saul. He is wounded. He is, is, is in the process of, and he's bearing fruit. He's bearing the fruit of the Spirit of God in his life. That love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. You know, in my own devotions, I usually begin reading the Psalms. And, and I've really come to realize why that is. It's because I see in this guy, this this one who has been wounded, who's been cut to the heart, who's been broken and wounded, I see what comes out of him and it strengthens me. Can I show you one last thing? In Luke chapter 22, 
and verse 53, the Lord Jesus writes, or, or Lord Jesus says, from the Garden of Gethsemane, after they, they, the Sanhedrin come and they, they take him and they surround him, he says, when I was with you daily in the temple, you didn't try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness, but this is your hour. That one little statement is amazing, but this is your hour. You think that you have the steering wheel? You think that you are in control, but God is controlling it all. Today is Friday, the Lord Jesus is saying, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday today, but Sunday's coming. And you will find out Sunday morning that you aren't driving this at all. The God of all there is, is in control. This is all part of God's plan to redeem man. What a thought. What a God. What a mighty God we serve. Thank you, Father, again for your word. And I pray that you would give us strength as we face those situations in our life where we are being attacked, where we are broken. I pray, oh God, that we would learn how to bleed Jesus, not be a bleeding heart, but to, to when we are broken, that Jesus would shine through those cracks. Oh God, may we be strengthened in the power of your might in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us today, folks. Lord bless.